I just did an interview with uh, Darsha Navarez. I don't know if you know her work, but she's uh, out of the University of Notre Dame. And uh, her, her, her focus now is on what she calls the uh, evolved nest. And she's talking about how indigenous ways of child rearing uh, contrast with the dominant and what the results are as adults. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I've read some. Well, I was in part of the book that we where we met, actually. Well, that's right, of course. Yeah, yeah, Notre Dame conference. Right. You were yeah. in our conference, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and um, I've, so I've read her paper from there and it's just amazing work. Yeah, yeah it's really, really an exciting interview. It'll be up Monday, I'll, sh I'll send it to you. And share it with your class maybe. So Erica, do you want to, um, should we think we should wait one more minute? I can't hear you. Your voice has disappeared. There you oh. go. Sure. Yeah. We can start whenever you'd like to. Um, I think Michael's here and, and we'll start the recording whenever you say go. Just a note for everybody, we will be recording. So we'll make the video and recording available. We'll also make the chat available. Um, and that's how we'll talk through some of the, the questions and discussion. Thanks, Erica. Do you want to introduce the whole series and then I'll introduce um, and, sure. and talk about the chat function? Great, okay, I see that we're recording. Wonderful, welcome. So nice to see all of you, um, familiar faces and new. Um, welcome to the Intellectual Shaman series of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, Sandra is um, leading us today in conversation with Four Arrows and we'll uh, shortly be introducing him. So nice for you to, to join us. Thank you uh, from Mexico, is that right? Yes, right here in sunny, in sunny Mexico between Puerto Vallarta and Manzanilla, out, out, uh, sort of really in the wilderness. It's a little, the closest fishing village is about 10 minutes and it's all dirt roads. Great, well, I'll turn this right over to Sandra. Um, we'll be putting some more information in the chat. Um, again, this is an initi initiative of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, I think the reason I'm gathered and I hope many of you are gathered are really for the greater purpose of advancing the protection of dignity and the promotion of well-being. Um, and to that end, I will turn it right over to Sandra. Nice to see you all, thanks. Thanks, Erica and Michael. Um, so um, I first met Four Arrows about four years ago at a conference at Notre Dame that we were just briefly chatting about. Um, and we, I, I just felt like we immediately connected. Um, he is just this amazing person and I'm hoping that you all really will enjoy his talk today. Um, he is formerly Dean of Education at Oglala Lakota College and a tenured Associate Professor of Education at Northern Arizona University. He's currently a professor with the Fielding Graduate University where he teaches doctoral students. He was selected as one of 27 visionaries in education for the Arrow uh, Text Turning Points and is author of 22 books and multiple articles. Um, um, many of them on indigenous worldviews and its application to education, sustainability, wellness, and social justice. He's a recipient of a Martin Springer Institute for Holocaust Studies Moral Courage Award for his activism on behalf of indigenous peoples. And his book, Teaching Truly, a Curriculum to Indigenize Mainstream Education, was selected as one of the top 20 progressive education books. Two books have been published on or about his work. Um, so he has books written about him as well. He does podcasts often. In fact, he just got off of another podcast. So uh, we're glad we, he could manage to find some time to be with us today. Um, and as an aside, he's, um, I consider him a polymath from what I know, and I don't know everything, I'm sure. But he was an Olympic level equestrian. He broke Broncos. He's a prize winning old time piano player. Um, as I said, a frequent speaker on podcasts and other uh, broadcast outlets, and he's a surfer. And just behind him, I think you can see where he goes surfing. Um, and I'm sure there's so much more that I'm not aware of. So he's going to give us a little bit of perspective on his idea of indigenous worldview and how that might help 
all of us and um, perhaps introduce us to a technique that he's uh, developed that can help us all to lead healthier and more effective lives. And this is the, uh, Four Arrows is a true shaman. Um, he's, he's an intellectual shaman, but he's also a real shaman in, in the, in the uh, indigenous culture. And so I really wanna welcome you and thank you for being with us today. I'm gonna turn it over to you for about 20 minutes and then I'll ask you for a few questions. And for anybody, who um, has questions for Four Arrows as we go along, just put them into chat and Erica and I will monitor them. And she'll help me to pick out some questions to, um, to uh, engage with him on later on, okay? So Four Arrows, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If you could just sort of introduce us to this idea of indigenous well, perspective. I got my balloon up so high. Let me throw a couple of pins in it. Uh, um, I didn't even know what a polymath was when you first, uh, when you, you first said that, and so and, and my daughter's a mathematician, but I was embarrassed to ask her. Right, so I look, I look, I looked it up, uh, and you know, I, I appreciate uh, the the introduction. And, and uh, in our dominant worldview, those introductions are helpful uh, because they tend to increase the credibility of what's about to be said. Um, that really doesn't happen in indigenous cultures we, we we respect each person for who they are and each story that they tell um and and in fact it's kind of looked down on a little bit to 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 put them up on on a, on a pedestal but we are in a hierarchical kind of a worldview and and the idea of authority and the idea of that's what we get doctoral degrees for right is to is to establish that and so i'm not saying it's it's bad or wrong it, it, and it actually works. It, it actually increases the hypnotizability of my words, if you will, to uh, to help people grasp certain ideas, and so that they're not saying, "Well, who's you know, what 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 right does he have to to, to say this kind of thing?" So I just wanted to share that. Um, humor is such an important part of indigeneity, and I I know we only have twenty minutes, so um, I don't want to. Uh, you know, it takes me a long time to tell jokes, but they're they're instrumental in, in indigeneity and have helped us survive. And we are in tough times. We're we're uh, I, I don't have a lot of hope anymore that we're going to move uh, beyond the extinction uh, that we are in the throes of. And and that's a difficult thing to say. I've only you know first time I said it was at UBC last year and. Someone says, well, then why are you still doing this work if you think that, that we don't have a very good chance of turning it around? And I say, it's all the more reason to do this work. And, and, and uh, you know, you said it, someone said it earlier about this is about protecting dignity. And this is the time to, to display and protect uh, dignity and promote it. And so, um, I'm, I, so I, I not without time to say the whole joke. I decided that I'm gonna spend the 20 minutes sort of just introducing you to the tail end of three jokes that I like, that I think will really introduce uh, enough to really stimulate some questions from each of you, and so we can get into interactiveness, which is, which is what I like most. And each of these jokes is certainly partly true, um, but uh, not all all true. The first one was when I was at uh, on the Pine Ridge Reservation, um, of course, which is a place in the United States with uh, statistics for health and well-being that are worse than Haiti. Um, the first sitting president ever to visit a reservation was Bill Clinton, and he came to talk to us about uh, creating an empowerment zone and telling us all the good things he was going to do. And every time he'd say something, everybody in the crowd, the whole reservation turned out. He was up on a stage. You know, he would say, well, I'm going to make sure that the, ch that the children know that the first Americans are not Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. Everybody went, who are you? And he says, I'm going to make sure all of the, um, the commodities that, that you're getting uh, are not full of sugar so that the diabetes rates continue. We're going to bring organic food and help you. Everyone went huya. We're going to make sure the roads in the wintertime don't uh, make the school buses go off because of the mud and, and, and slime. Everybody went huya. He was about, and he went on like that, and the crowd was in enthusiastic with huya. And then it was time for him to step off the stage, and he just about stepped into a big cow pie. 
and a young Lakota boy said, Mr. President, be careful, you're about to step in the Huya. And so, you know, um, the, what's the moral of that? Uh, in indigenous ways of being, how we all lived, our ancestors all lived for about 99% of human history up until maybe eight or 9,000 years ago. Um, the the self-authority was crucial. There were, there were hierarchies did not exist. And when they did, they were what's called reverse dominant hierarchies. Um, truth seeking and truth telling were ways of, of being in and understanding the, the world. Um, uh, and today, you know, seeing through the overwhelming hegemony that still operates, uh, even in, in higher education, is, is, is part of uh, the importance of recognizing the, the huya, right? Um, and it's kind of, you know, uh, in, with all due respect for the importance, I mean, I'm in it, I'm a player, right, in higher education. I have been for many years. Um, um, but I really... I really oh, oh. Okay, can you all hear me still? Ellie, I think you need to mute. Somebody nod. But Give me the thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, good. But I just had a really weird. Uh, Somebody's got to mute Ellie. Happened, Ellie, right? um, yeah. But uh, in any case, um, the second one is uh, about how um, Lakota Elder was in the what's called the Badlands by the the, uh, the non-Indian people in, in Pine Ridge, and they were. Uh, there two astronauts were were walking around in full gear and the grandfather uh, sent his grandson over to ask them what they were doing and they said well we're preparing for a moon landing so anyway long you know long long joke short the uh, grandfather offered to the um uh, the, the two uh, nasa spacemen um, a letter and asked if, if he would bring that up it was written in Lakota, bring that up with them to the moon. So they thought this would be a great public relations phenomenon, right? And so the next week they had a big press conference with you know microphones from all over the world. And uh, when it was time to say, and we are bringing up uh, from an elder, uh, a message uh, that's gonna be placed on the moon. And uh, we're gonna have um, a Lakota elder read it. And the message said essentially, uh, dear moon people, watch these guys. They have come to, uh, to, uh, with a worldview that is so destructive that it will uh, destroy your, your life systems. Uh, and so the third joke is uh, um, uh, this is kind of a new age couple in, in Arizona, uh, near Red Rock in Sedona. Um, they wanted to go and see a real Indian. And uh, so they, they hired a, a Jeep and they, they drove up into the, the trails where the red rocks are. And right away, they came upon a, an Indian and wearing feathers and deer skins, uh, putting his ear to the ground and he put his hand up to stop them. They stopped the car and turned it off. And, and uh, the Indian says, hmm, pinto horse, English saddle. One horse has one blue eye, tall man riding him with red hair, wearing uh, a helmet, uh, riding fast. Of course, the woman is so excited. She says to her husband, I told you these Indians were magical. How can he know such details by just listening to the ground? I wonder when that rider will come. And the Indian hears them and, she, and he says, oh, they, they just ran over me. So, so then what's the moral of that story, okay? The, the moral of that is, is that uh, doing everything we can to re-embrace the indigenous worldview is important. I believe it's very important and becoming more and more important. And more and more people are, are recognizing that, that are top scholars. Um, but uh, it doesn't involve romanticizing indigenous peoples, past or present. Uh, and they're not a special group, actually. And it's not a special uh, anything, except it's uh, all people from all over the world with great diversity of beliefs and ceremonies, etc., who happen to have common denominators of a worldview that we all shared uh, for most of human history. And so, with these three these three jokes, you know, being 
critical thinkers, being uh, uh, skeptical of hierarchy and authority. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of jumping into the cat fawn a little bit while we're on authority. In indigenous worldview, the only true authority is your lived experience and your honest reflection on it under an umbrella of recognizing the interconnectedness of everything. That's the authority for, for decisions. Do we listen to, quote, wise elders that have special skills or know how to talk to certain spirits or know about the stars? Absolutely, with great respect. But the authority for our decisions um, are, are very autonomous. So when people think of indigeneity as uh, uh, collectivism versus the, uh, the dominant worldviews, individuality, it's not really true. The difference is, is that in indigenous ways, individuality is crucial for the greater good of the, com of the community as opposed to just for one's own promotion, okay? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, and, and the, the moon landing joke really tells us that we can't be in denial anymore about what's happening. Uh, you know, uh, David Attenborough at 93, you know, did his beautiful work in presenting uh, uh, the, the true history of, of, and, and where we are now. And although he had hope, um, uh, it was still very frank and very uh, awakening and sobering. And yet in it, uh, as much as I respect him, I, I, I didn't even want to write this piece, but I wrote a little piece uh, that was published that night saying that even David used colonizing language uh, by referring to the intelligence of humans as, as uh, you know, higher and by saying that, you know, uh, the, the environment, it, with his words, not in his heart, because I don't think he believes it, that, that, that the environment is still out there as opposed to being with us. And then, uh, again, because uh, it's, so, it's so easy to new age indigeneity, and there's also so many controversies about who can and should teach teach it. Um, I wrote an article for uh, critical education out of the University of British Columbia called um, uh, uh, um, "The Indigenization Controversy: For Whom, By Whom." Indian country is divided on whether information can come from non-Indian people. And um, I always like to quote uh, uh, you know, a lot of, of indigenous el elders that um, believe as I do, um, that like fools crow, that everyone is on the same sinking planet and no one owns these ceremonies. Um, and I'll just tell you one little story about that because I know that's on people's minds as well. You know, I'm, I don't have any affiliation. I don't want to misappropriate. Uh, that happens too much already. I don't have the, the wisdom to be able to engage in learning how to talk about indigenous worldview. And uh, a little story that, that will show you how Indian country is divided on this. Um, and I'm on the side of teaching it, obviously. Uh, my wife and I were playing music at, the, at a, a school in, uh, on the Navajo reservation that I was a co-founder of uh, on a board. And uh, we were doing a fundraiser and most people there were non-Indian, but all the Navajo students and, and uh, parents were there. And so B and I were playing some old time, you know, uh, jazz, uh, Dixieland jazz. And the last song that I played um, was a, 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 an EP ceremony song, a thank you song. And, uh, and that, that we, just, we just played it and I sang it and uh, to give thanks. Right away, a respected medicine person walked up to me and scolded me. He said, Four Arrows, you know better than to take that out of the circle, meaning out of the sacred ceremony. And I thanked him with my heart. I said, thank you, my brother, but we disagree on this one. Not a minute later, another very respected, because I'll add, I think, more respected <laughs> uh, medicine person comes up and he said, Four Arrows. Thank you for taking that out of the circle and sharing that with everyone. Right? And so, sir, with that out of the way, um, I just want to introduce 
within the next five minutes that I have before we open this up, I just want to introduce you to what I call uh, a, um, well, well, actually it's not me, but it's someone that wrote about this, Dr. Uh, Michael Fisher, calls a dehypnotizing technology. I just call it a vision. Uh, others have referred to it as a metacognitive worldview reflection strategy. And I, and I refer to it as the cat fawn connection. And uh, it came to me as a near death experience. Um, when I got out, I was an officer and a, a pilot in the Marine Corps during the Vietnam era. When I got out, I was an angry young man. Uh, I used a lot of uh, white water adventures and rock climbing and all kinds of things to kind of get the chip off my shoulder. And I was trying to do the Rio Reek here in Mexico. I'd never been ascended. And I had a near-death experience because the entire river disappeared into an underground drainage. And on, trying to escape, we had to stay in a cave where a mountain lion actually showed us the way out. And then uh, Tarahumara, Ravamuri, Cimarron people would occasionally show up in this 8,000 foot climb out to show us how to get out. And one of them was carrying a fawn that, that they had run down its, its feet. It got to where it couldn't run anymore. And then the, the Ravamuri person went out and said a prayer, clubbed it, and they brought it another 40 miles back to his village for food. And the next day after seeing both of those, I had a vision of the cat and the fawn turning into letters. And that's how, uh, and there's a lot more to it, of course, but uh, eventually I, I understood it. And cat is the phenomenon uh, of trance-based learning. And all ceremonies, indigenous people knew this without understanding terms like brainwave frequency, neuropsychology, or hypnosis. They understood that if they really wanted to maximize potential, to be more generous in the community, to be a better uh, uh, searcher of, of grasses and berries or a hunter, whatever, they knew that with intention, with changing brain, brainwave frequencies, and with a sense of believing deeply in the image, based on the, the, the sacredness of the ritual, that those things would happen. And, and, and they did, and they do. And that's really essentially, I taught hypnosis at UC Berkeley for MFCC licensure. And, and it's the same kind of an idea, that it's, and it's all ultimately self-hypnosis. So that's what CAT is, concentration activated transformation. Concentration activated transformation. And it's so important. How else can we explain humanity destroying its life systems. If, if it's not a logical thing, you know, and even for people that are, are, are practicing greed, it's still, you know, it's still not logical. There's a hypnosis involved, just like a young person who's told they're never gonna to amount to anything when they're in a state of spontaneous trance and no matter how successful they are, they still feel it, right? This is the phenomenon of spontaneous hypnosis. I can't emphasize that enough. Secondly, I chose four concepts that worldview indigenous and worldview dominant. And according to Robert Redfield, the father of social anthropology, we only have two worldviews. So I know most of you are thinking a worldview is a religion, a culture, a philosophy, an ideology. There's millions of them. I like to embrace the concept that, that there's a great diversity of all of those things under two worldviews, but there are common denominators that each group shares. And one is what uh, uh, Redfield referred to as the metropolitan or dominant worldview. And the other one he referred to as the primitive. And he was very sad to see the primitive or the dominant or the indigenous, I'm sorry, being, you know, having a demise. Well, the four things that are very different are how we look at fear, authority, words, and nature for the fawn. And notice how the cat and the fawn are symbiotic. And we know this about nature. Uh, the fawn uh, ways of being uh, in an indigenous are, are very, very, very different than those in the, in the dominant. And maybe we'll have a chance to mention those in our dialogue, but I think I went over my 20 minutes. So let's turn it over to all of you. Uh, I, I, I thought I'd ask you a couple of questions first, if that's okay. Um, and actually, I would, I would, I would be hoping you would share a little bit more with us between of the difference between the dominant worldview and the indigenous worldview. Okay, super. And um, and, and while I'm doing that, why don't you give me the control of share screen, and then I'll show all of the 
the contrast. Uh, just put it on the screen for everybody. Yeah, right? I think you can. I think you can do that now. Okay. All right. So let me uh, let me start with the fawn. Um, in if I all if I asked all of you and think about it as I'm saying this, when you think of fear in yourself and in the culture that you live in, and in the dominant systems. What's, what it, what's the sense you have? What's the feeling? What, how would you talk about it, right? What we've learned, and I say we because there's a number of researchers that I've borrowed from in different interdisciplinary fields, is that we don't like fear in the dominant worldview. Fear is something to avoid at all, at all costs, sort of. And I'm talking about after the fight or flight mechanism that's natural for fear. You know, a truck's coming at you or a lion and you got to decide. I'm talking about the kind of long-term fear that we all uh, are, are, are facing, for example, with an imminent extinction phenomenon. Well, in indigenous cultures, and, I, and I've seen this, and I've lived with three or four uh, cultures that have not had access to hardly at all to the Western way, and I've studied many pre-contact in my doctoral research. Fear is, once fight or flight is over, it's an opportunity to practice a, a virtue. And, and the universal virtues, you know, and all of the work on character education, and moral education are generosity, patience, courage, honesty, fortitude, humility, right? And, and so, so, and I imagine, and this is a story I told the students, it, just, it, came, it came to me just then, I'll say it again. Imagine you are out hunting uh, for berries in, a, in the wilderness and a grizzly bear uh, mother, shows right up in front of you in the trail. You know you can't fight or run. And so now, think of it from your dominant worldview. I mean, most of us in the dominant worldview are going to just, you know, pee in our pants, so to speak, right? We're going to just be so frightened and we're going to put out that odor of fear. We're not going to know what to do. We're going to scream, cry, pray, whatever it is. Think about what it would be if you said, hmm, Okay, this mother bear is paw on the ground, and I, I can't outrun her. I'm not going to fight her. Well, what virtue have I been working on? Hmm. You know, uh, and I, I used generosity the other day, and you know, the generosity one would be, grandmother, if you need, if your children need my body more than my children need these berries, I give myself to you. And the bear never having been treated that way lets you go. But you can take each one of the virtues and you can see how in that situation. So think about the David Attenborough film that just came out. Think about the, the largest study ever done that shows that in the next generation, this is the United Nations Extinction Rate Report, May 2019. Google four arrows you in the nation and you can read my per take on that and why no one's talking about it. Um, they said that a million estimated species will go extinct in one generation. We can't talk about these things with students and not worry about what kinds of ab reactions, what kinds of fear we're playing into or, or starting or creating. And yet we have to talk about them. And, and, and so how wonderful if we could teach our students, okay, you know, how do we work on on, 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 the, on the respectfulness, that dignity, uh, and our, 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 our spiritual beings that are in our bodies, and how we continue somehow, we don't know how, it's a great mysterious thing, but somehow we know rebirthing ideas, reincarnation ideas, you know, there's only one scholar, Ian Stevenson, that really studied it, and he says it's, you know, based on his incredible empirical studies, he says, no proof, but certainly the highest probability of explaining the things that he, that, he, that he put forward, right? And so what if there's this sense of continuation? Isn't that all the more reason that we should get the vibrations as high as we can, no matter what is going to happen, right? And, and not worry about whether we have to hope for returning it around or not. Just live our highest way, live our highest, our highest path. So that's the fear. And the authority is almost everyone here, we are playing into one way or the other and have most of our lives external authority as the source of authority. 
you think about all the sources, your father, your mother, the Pope, the preacher, the peddler, the president, you name it, right? Our system is designed for that. We talked about that a little bit in our opening. And uh, I, I shared with you what, what true authority is. And that relates to fear completely, right? And it also relates to from moving to, from courage to fearlessness, which is something that I mentioned to the students um, that I can talk about if you're interested. Then words, words, all you gotta do is look at the epitome of what's happening with Donald Trump and his administration and many others in the Democratic Party and many salesmen and on and on and on. Tom uh, um, Cooper wrote a great book called A Time Before Deception about how we, you know, how, in, how our ancestors, how indigenous people, even in the 1800s, we did ceremonies when the Europeans came and lied to us about treaties because we thought they had a mental illness and could not describe reality, right? Uh, so we are in a post-truth age. Even little children, even little children are using deception to avoid any consequences they perceive or whatever, right? And, uh, and so very, very different. And now it's, it's harder to do in, in European languages like the English language. It's, it's harder to be completely truthful. Why is that? It's because our original languages were motion and growth and change oriented. They were verb based languages, right? And, 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 and to describe an oak tree, you'd have to know what time of year, what kind of animals are in it, is the wind blowing? It's very much more complex. And so it's so easy to categorize, even if we think we're telling the truth, we're only, we're, we're, we're lumping so many multifaceted aspects of the truth into that conclusion that it's really not the truth. So what do we do with that without learning and speaking in, in indigenous languages? In English, we just work really hard to understand what Kipling said when he said words are mankind's most powerful drug. And then we recognize that when we talk to ourselves, we recognize that when we talk to our students and when we talk to each other and we try our best, even though time commitments say, oh, I gotta be real quick on this. Well, let me finish that. I'm not completely finished with what I'm trying to say here. Uh, you know, working at, at avoiding to any kinds of misinformation or deception, not just scholarly research to back yourself up, but in every way trying to be truthful. That's very different, right? And moving into an indigenous worldview that combines this idea about fear, authority, and, and words really makes it much easier than you might imagine. And then the fourth one that I have, have offered is nature. You've got to use concentration activated transformation to take your cognitive, metacognitive, worldview reflection work with, cat, with the fawn. You're not gonna with willful determination transform yourself so that the next time you're talking to somebody, you, you, know, you actually implemented it. The in vivo exposure is vital to go out and do this right afterwards. I hope you all will practice it right after we're done. That's when you do your self-hypnosis, which you can do in two minutes. You can do it with, with a pendulum. You can do it by imagining your arm lifting up. Uh, once you go into an a, a alternative brainwave frequency, your brain is responsive to imagery. And that responsiveness, you can see, ah, I'm, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm in that like trance state now, whereas otherwise you might not know it. Because imagining something while you're in beta doesn't really accomplish the automaticity that we're looking for to do things like lowering blood pressure, or stopping bleeding, let alone being able to transform the old belief systems about fear of public speaking or whatever. Nature is the missing link in combining the worldview and the, uh, the, the let's call it self, self hypnosis or trance learning. Nature is the missing link because in nature, the vibrations and the memories are such that they bring you into the, in the dominant way of being that we practice for most of history and the naturalness of the use of the trance. And it doesn't have to be going out way into the wilderness. Like, I mean, if you see where I'm at right now, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded. Every place you can see around me 
is just wilderness. I, I choose that, but not everybody can do that. Um, but I've been in cities and I can go and find uh, a, a, an apartment garden or uh, weeds growing out of the concrete or uh, a cockroach in the bathroom. I mean, once you start to focus on other than human, you begin to get into a place where the DNA memory kicks in that makes all this work easier. Okay, so again, this is not an easy thing to do in a short time. So um, I have I have so many more questions. Um, I was hoping you'd share with us, uh, and then we'll turn it over to some questions from people who are listening. Um, you'd share with us that I know you have this um, set of principles for for right, the. Sure. Yeah, let's 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 do the chart real quick, just so that you see that there, that those four that I named are are very very powerful, but they all go together with. Uh, here it is. And these are all ones that have been researched uh, in, in, in cultures today and, and, and in all of the work of histor historians working on it, right? That generally speaking, generally speaking, the many great diverse cultures and religions that are under the dominant worldview tend, you know, with some people bouncing back and forth or some, some when you're over on the right side already, but generally speaking, they are rigid hierarchies. They're fear-based. People don't have strong social purposes. They focus on self and personal gain. There's rigid and discriminatory gender stereotypes. There's materialistic ways of being. Uh, there's seeing the earth as an unloving it. Uh, there's more head than heart. The competition is all is, is strong and about feeling superior to our other, uh, and of course you know there's the, uh, the indigenous uh, uh, alternative to them, right? Um, that's on the other side, right? But so you can just kind of look at them as I go down. Um, I think probably uh, the most important one when you're doing the cat fawn work has to do with not seeing sentience. Um, and other than, than humans. Uh, I was just recently reading a passage out of Jane Goodall, uh, who was the first human to show that animals have made tools. And this is in the 1960s, right? And, and she didn't know it because she didn't have any university experience and she, Leakey just sent her out to do it because she was a good observer. She didn't know that while she was sending the photographs back of them making tools and using them to get termites, that she was, everybody in the, in the academy in the sciences, in, uh, environmental anthropology, geology, they were all calling her a buffoon, a fool, or she, she was on drugs, or that she had no qualifications, etc. Right? And uh, she, I remember in the in the book uh, that she wrote just a couple of years ago, she says, "A good thing I didn't go to university because I never would have discovered uh, what I did had I not personalized and saw and integrated myself with them as intelligent others." Right? So I think that's that's uh that's one that you'll that you'll see and my wife just sent me a bird uh picture uh, a, a vimeo of of a parrot and i've had one so i know how intelligent they are uh it used to go surfing with me you might have saw it on the picture on my desktop but this one was making strips tearing strips out of a calendar on the wall that were different colors that were long and then attaching them to its tail to decorate its tail. I'm like, oh my gosh, how can anybody think that humans are, how can we be so arrogant? So anyway, so all of these worked in, in harmony with each other. And you might catch one that, you know, I'm not doing that. My students now use these for every class. I mean, every course and every class. And uh, the, the regular use of them and looking at Whatever problematic, whether it's systems thinking or organizational development or whatever, we someone will come up and say, you know what? I think that theory is leaning way too far in looking at, uh, you know, learning is fragmented or, uh, you know, um, you know look, looking at uh, a didactic, you know, whatever. They'll pick one and we'll say, well, how would we change that? 
in, in, in business and industry or in corporations or in education or in whatever. How would we do that? I mean, take diversity and inclusion. We just at my university hired a chief diversity officer. I was very much against it. Uh, uh, but uh, and I, in my most recent book that was been endorsed by um, Dr. Vandana Shiva uh, talks about the research that shows that they don't work. Why don't they work? Because trying to use hierarchy to cultivate diversity and inclusion is almost starting on the wrong foot, right? And the kinds of ways that, that, it, that it happens. So yeah, can a chief diversity officer be useful as someone to, to implement it? Well, I think with indigenous worldview it's, it's possible. But with indigenous worldview, we wouldn't need that. We wouldn't have to have that need, right? For 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 it. So so anyway, so that's that's the that's the chart. So and so I'm for happy to send it to anybody that emails me. Yeah, that that was the uh, question. I'm we're getting a lot of requests for. Can yeah, they yeah, get just e that? just email me and I will fire it off to you. Um, or you can do that. You you've got it too. Uh, if you want to 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 email Sandra, you have have my permission to share it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. If you could send it to me again, that would be. I great. sure will. Yeah. Sure will. So that we have a number of questions, and I think um, Nathan Victoria, would you like to ask your question? Just unmute yourself. Sure, I'm happy to jump on for hours. Thank you so much for your your thoughts and words. Hey, hey, did, did, so did, did Victoria ever clean up that uh, that that ocean sewage thing that everybody was working on, but nobody <laughs> wanted it in their backyard? <laughs> Can't promise. Uh, okay. Other people related to me. Um, so I'm a doctoral candidate at the George Washington University in Human and Organizational Learning, um, and I'm specifically looking at how racially minoritized volunteer leaders navigate whiteness in their professional associations. Um, and without going into the whole lit review, what I've been struggling with is um, identify as Filipino and um, Spanish. And a lot of the work that's the foundation is um, black authors, indigenous authors, people that I don't necessarily share the lived experience of. And, and I'm curious your thoughts, and, and you spoke a little bit about it earlier, um, but do you have any other tips, advice around how not to colonize these non-lived experiences. You know, I feel um, there's a lot of similarities, I think, of the Filipinos to uh, with the colonization of the US and, and you know, my narrative and history. Um, but I'm curious if you have any other thoughts around how um, we can continue to uh, influence and use these other methodologies where we don't have the actual lived experience of um, set, set stories. Well, I, I think you, you already nailed it down when you brought up the concept of, of colonization. The, the opposite of inclusion is not exclusion, whether you're, you're, you're Latinx or whatever. Um, it's decolonization. And, and, and so I have a lot of uh, Latino students who, like everyone, we're maybe, uh, they, they feel they're a little closer to the original worldview. And so don't think of indigeneity as being uh, a, a cultural group anymore. Think of it instead, and don't think of, 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 of Latino as being a cultural group. I don't, I don't mean across the board, right? But in terms of your dissertation research, think about how Latino cultures, the, 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 the Hispanic Mexican people that are, that are here, they have no idea about their indigenous background anymore. And they're more indigenous than I am with my Irish background. Um, think about how we're a little, maybe the DNA is a little closer to it, but think about how there was no such thing as skin color racism in the Americas before 1492. Even with the colonized problematics in Europe that caused the, the first major pandemic in the 13th century, right? What was that caused from? That was caused from deforestation, war, lack of hygiene, just like no one's paying attention to the deforestation today that caused the corona, coronavirus, COVID-19. But, but everybody was ruling and doing good or bad. Or color did, had no, no consequence either way. It was a rationalization for colonization. And so I think it's, how, it's helpful for us to really, instead of self-protection of our various cultures as alienated from this 
original way of being in the world that we can talk about the uniqueness of our individual cultures just like I talk about Lakota culture very differently than I talk about Navajo culture, right? And you would do that same. And, and an African-American culture would be very different than a current indigenous culture, uh, right? So culture is one thing and it's vitally important, right? I'm a, I don't know anything about culture. When I talk to people, I say, I'm a pan-Indian specialist. What that means is I'm sad that I don't have a Latino culture or a uh, Irish culture. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have that either. I, I've never even been to my homeland in Ireland. I'm sad about that. You know, I don't really have a culture. And place-based knowledge that language comes from, that's not about worldview per se. That's about place-based knowledge. What I'm saying is a starting place is for us to acknowledge the worldview that each of those cultures once had so that we don't have to, again, worry about uh, cultures in a competitive, uh, prejudicial way. Am I making any sense? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm utilizing um, queer theory as one of my theoretical lenses, and for me, Queer theory is more about norms and the manifestation of norms rather than sexual orientation. So it's I think a great idea, example. It's yeah. a great example because if you go into cultures and I, even indigenous cultures who have been colonized, or even people I know who speak fluently, this is why I said this is everybody's game. They are coming up with uh, a bias against, uh, 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 and it's like, no, 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 that isn't how it originally was. It's just that's the, even the language has got colonized, right? So if we go back to, and I wrote a whole article on this for a book on, uh, uh, on uh, homophobia on campuses, I think the title of it is. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and, and I, I titled my chapter intentionally, it's not natural with an exclamation mark to try to get, you know, and of course, what the article is about is if we go to the original worldview that was based on nature, it was un it's unnatural to think it's not natural, right? And so we got to get back to the basic worldview. Now, in most places, there are no more people that know place-based knowledge. We've killed them. So we have to re-indigenize ourselves and reculturalize ourselves to whatever place we're living in, right? and create new languages for the flora and fauna and whatever, right? Um, and I hope the people that rebuild, the hope we believe that we have been arrogant and failed uh, uh, four times before, with the last one ending in a great flood for the purification. Um, and that we have seven, some people, the Hopi, the Mayans say nine. Uh, you know, if that is the case, then uh, that's how, it, let's, when we start over again, you know, We'll have this in mind. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Peter Jones, you want Peter? You want to uh, ask your question? Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I asked a question about uh, which is how we let's say that as um, so me as, as a professor in Canada at uh, at an art and design school that is actively working on its decolonization of the curriculum. Now in the indigenous people that, that I actually work with and engage with, they see decolonization differently than, the, than this idea. They don't, they don't want us to kind of make good with the Indian. They're basically, we want our land back and the treaties to be recognized. So in my like alignment with, with that in, intention, the Idle No More movement and the, indige the, the uh, in, indigenous resurgence in Canada is, is, is about this restoration of treaties and land. And yet I, I see in a lot of the engagement, it's a lot of it's being pushed down to us as identities instead of like being allies to their commitment. And so we, this can be hard to speak to when I'm not indigenous myself. So if I don't have uh, indigenous folks in the room, like, and I'm bringing this up, how this is like something I think everyone has to work oh, out for themselves. How do I advocate? Oh, this is, I'm so glad that you brought this up. That's 
what, what I meant when she mentioned the book Teaching Truly, a curriculum to indigenize mainstream education, right? The whole first two chapters are about exactly what you're saying. And, and in short, let me, let me answer it if I can, as, as, as I feel it in, in my heart, as Fool's Crow, uh, if you look up, uh, or send me an email, I'll send you quotes that Fool's Crow, uh, his uh, biographers put in, right? Um, number one, we have to give back to the remaining spokespeople and the potential spokespeople who are the indigenous people. It's not a coincidence that the largest study ever done that I mentioned, right? 50 countries, 450 researchers, 15,000 peer reviewed papers. They say this extinction rate that I mentioned about a million was non-existent are severely reduced in places where indigenous cultures have control of the, of the land. 80% of all the, of the biodiversity on mother earth today is on only 20% of the land mass that they possess. So we need to use them as teachers when we can. As I said, though, indigenous people who've been colonized for 200 years, trust me, there are very few left that have not still suffered that. So what we've got, what I believe is, by teaching the value of indigenous worldview to all of the colonizers, they will start to respect for the first time the reason we're trying to get sovereignty as, as First Nations. The reason why we're trying to save our languages, which have the place-based knowledge. You know, to me, going with the pan-Indian generalized worldview, which is a risk. My, co my colleagues are right, it's a risk. I mean, I, I can say right now, the last place that decol the decolonization and indigenous worldview should be taught is in the institution of education. That's what has the, been the problem, right? I mean, right now, every one of my emails that I send out, every single one of them, I have this little thing on it and people don't like it too much. Um, it says, it's a quote from Moulton and Harney. It cannot be accepted that the university is a place of enlightenment. One can sneak into the university and steal what one can to abuse its hospitality, to spite its mission, to join its refugee colony, its gypsy encampment is to be in, but not of uh, the, uh, the, and it's the path of the subversive intellectual in the modern university, right? You can imagine my administrators don't like me putting that out. So absolutely, is this a concern? If sovereignty isn't constantly being promoted, if you're not on the front lines, I did four tours of duty at Standing Rock. If you're not on the front line, if you're not doing everything you can to support the efforts for sovereignty, right, and, uh, and, and, and getting, our, getting land back and saving the language, then you, you, you can't be in this work. But you, you don't have the skills for the language and the individual culture. You can only support it. You do have the skills and I believe the right uh, to bring forth the worldview. And I, and I wish I could uh, uh, pull it, send me, I'll send you Fool's Crow's quotes. I mean, he says, the many indigenous brothers that he and sisters that he have that think that we should, that, that, that we cannot use the white allies, they don't really understand the medicine. White standing Buffalo uh, out of Canada. He was at the Notre Dame conference. Uh, he was one of the people I invited. We got into a situation at the last, that the, after the, Sandra, do you remember this? After the, <laughs> were you the first, okay, after our first presentation, three of the women that I invited there, indigenous women, and dear, dear friends of mine said, we're giving too much information out to this white audience. And I'm going, oh no, that was the whole reason we did an indigenization conference, you know, spent a lot of money on it. And so I knew if I said something, it wasn't gonna work as well as if I, I brought, I managed to get somebody without a doctoral degree, without a high school diploma, who's a Sundance leader, a Cree, and, I, and I'm, I'm so glad I bought him, brought him because I looked at, at, at him and I said, can you speak to that, my brother? And he spoke for 20 minutes. And at the end, everybody was on the table. We're gonna share this, right? So there's responsibilities, yes. You know, uh, can, it, can it go into, a, is, it, is it at risk? Yeah, Rick, two dogs won't let non-Indian people in our Sundance. 
but he'll let them in every other ceremony. And so I asked him one day, I said, so what is this? I mean, I thought you agreed with, he says, I do agree with you. It's just that in this case, the spirit said, no, you know, that the risk of compromising this particular ceremony for me, but he's got lots of other brothers he respects equally that allow non-Indians to, to pay their dues and to, and to learn, right? So it's complex. Read my article, The Indigenization Controversy, For Whom, By Whom. You can Google it and it'll come right up. Good question. Will. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll okay. follow up with that and we'll keep the ceremonies. We're doing talking circles um, continuously, uh, sweat lodges. We're working with the Anishinaabe community and helping them restore women's indigenous governance because that's how they're organizing. And so my people are that I'm working with are doing that. And so this has been fantastic. Thank well, you. Thank, and like thank that. you. Thank you for what you're what you're doing. And because it's, it's that's what we're trying to do. Thank oh. you. Thanks, Peter. I think we have time for one more question, although there's a whole bunch of them here. And I'd, like I'd, like very... I'd like to close with a prayer since we didn't open with one, if I may. Oh, OK. So would you just rather give me 30 seconds for that? And you can just kind of click off after I'm done. OK, um, I think we still have time for one more question. Um, Anne Matheson, you had a very uh, uh, you had a quick question, so you want to ask it? You still here? I don't see her. Anne's question was, um, a fear of the dominant is a fear from lack. Can you speak to first people's view of receiving? Uh, a fear of the dominant is a fear of... From, from lack. Fear from, from lack. lack. Yeah. The, the idea of sort of a zero sum. The opposite uh, of abundance, right. Right, right. This kind of gets into the idea of, of, of respect for what we call natural resources as relatives, not as natural resources, but as relatives. It gets into the idea of moving from courage to fearlessness, which is trusting in the, in the universe. Uh, once we begin to adopt a dominant worldview, and I might need more clarification on the question if this doesn't get to it. But once we adopt the ideas of, of hierarchy, that nature is strictly for utilitarianism for human beings, uh, that, um, they are, that, that the trees are not relatives uh, from a, in, a, in, a, in a true sentient kind of way, we begin to... Uh, have both a fear of a lack of enoughness because we don't realize that everything is there for us now. And so this, this idea of, of accumulation is the lack of understanding who we really are. Now, let me stop there and ask, ask you to, to clarify the question more if I didn't come close. Yeah, I'm, I, that's all I have because. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Um, so um, I'm. I was when when Boros came to my class on Monday, and he he began with a prayer and he ended with uh, playing your flute. I wonder if your flute is available too. <laughs> sure. Well, I want to just first. I want to thank everyone's energy uh, and 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 interest in in in. in Trying to remember who we are for the right reasons, no matter what, is kind of how I would conclude. And can, and, can uh, I say, can I say thank you because I think you've given us a great gift here. Um, I know that um, sharing these ideas is just so important for so many of us who are in the in the quote unquote dominant culture today. And just hearing your perspective, I just find so helpful. And there are just tons of thank you comments in the uh, chat. I don't know if you've been able to follow any of those. Um, so uh, I wanna thank everybody for attending and um, and thank you again for Eros for joining us and Erica and Michael for organizing everything. Well, thank and, and so this this song I'm going to play is, is a song that was sung by the Cherokee mothers on the Trail of Tears. And if you can imagine that being sort of equal to what we're facing now, um, know that the words, which I won't be able to sing while I play the, the flute and I don't do them well anyway, uh, are saying to the child, but did you see the beautiful animal shapes in the clouds? 
Did you see the dancing grasses in the prairie? Did you hear the beautiful songs of the meadowlark? Did you see the colors of the trout when we crossed the brook? In other words, like the Navajo, my Navajo students talk about the Hoso way, the, the beauty path, the pollen path, seeing the beauty above, below, to the right, the left, all around us is crucial in these times. I'll say that in Lakota and then I'll, I'll finish uh, with, the, with the song and, and you can just sign off as you listen to the melody of, the, of this ancient flute. Tunkashila, Wakantanka, Namakompo, Nadatewa Toko, Na Ushimaka, Okichiapi, Makaye Kapi, Che, Oyate, Oya Sin Unchi, Wichalapon, Oichaki, Pohelcha, Wichazani Washte, when you are big day low. Oyate, Oya Sin Chanko Luta, Ochnamani, Oichaki, La Chawa Chino, Hechena, Oyate, Kini, Pik, Dehani Lako, Wichuanki, Tunkashi, Kiksu. Bye, everybody. Thank you.